Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> I am Steph, the Shakespeare. I am Swan, the sketching. I love it. It's so bad. I love it. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, we are here today to draw you a Shakespearean scene. Now, today is a special day for this show because this is kind of a, this is a, a message for all of you who feel like Shakespeare is boring or stale or not, you know, um, easily able to be interpreted in the 21st century. This is like a, this is, we are opening our arms and we are showing you just how um, wild Shakespeare can be. So I want to preface this with Swan has not heard the scene. Um, normally, like I give her like context and the scene ahead of time and, and everything. But like this is, I was like, I don't want you to read it. <laughs> I'm just going to say it out loud to you when we get on stream. And you are going <laughs> to just draw it. So for those of you who are new to sketching Shakespeare, um, we are, we read through a scene or a monologue or a piece and then Swan, who is a brilliant artist, draws it. Yay! That's it. It's really cool. And then we uh, talk about art and Shakespeare. So if you have any questions on art, comics, um, drawing, any of that, or Shakespeare literature, any of that, we got you. Ask okay. questions. Uh, let us know your favorite Shakespeare pieces. Let us know your favorite comics. Let us know your inspirations for art and uh, literature and, and all that, because it is what we love and it's what we're here to, to yell about. Yeah. So this scene is from Cymbeline, which is okay. my favorite Shakespeare play. Uh, and it is my favorite Shakespeare play because it is so full of uh, absolute bananas things. Um, it's like Shakespeare was like, hey, I have, you know, 30 tools in my toolkit. I need to use them all. <laughs> I need to use every trope that I have ever used now. It's like he thought he was dying. Like, and this is one of his later plays. So okay. very well may have been like a, this is everything I've ever done and everything I will ever do. And I just need to put it all on this play. Because <laughs> if I die before I use these ideas, I'm going to be real mad about it. Oh. Yep. Um, but... <laughs> So um, this scene is, there is a, it's a very fairy tale play as well. And this scene, there is um, Imogen, who is a princess and she has gotten married uh, to someone her father doesn't approve of. So they sent her, her husband away, et cetera, et cetera. And then the evil queen has a son. So the king and the evil queen um, are married. Imogen is the princess. Cloten is the evil queen's son. Okay. And the evil queen is like, we got to get Cloten to marry Imogen so that I have, that, so that the throne is mine. Okay. Okay. Rather than Imogen's. Gotcha. And Cloten is a big, dumb dummy. <laughs> he is one of the, the, uh, he's, he's a big, dumb dummy, a uh, real meathead. And he's like, okay. So he tried, he's trying really hard to woo Imogen, who's already married, but like he doesn't care and he doesn't know any better. <laughs> so he shows up at her at her room. It's like 6 a.m., oh, barely, geez. barely light out. And he's like, I have hired musicians and they're gonna woo you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so context for this scene is he's standing outside her door, uh, like <laughs> before the sun's come up. And this is how he's going to woo her. So oh, Oh, I Here love it. It is. Um, I would this music would come. I am advised to give her music a mornings. They say it will penetrate. Come on, tune. If you can penetrate her with your fingering, so. We'll try with tongue, too. If none will do, let her remain. But I'll never give over. First, a very excellent, good, conceited thing. After, a wonderful, sweet air with admirable, rich words to it and then let her consider. The musicians begin to play. Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings and Phoebus gins arise. His steeds know to water at those springs on chaliced flowers that lies. 
And winking merry buds begin to ope their golden eyes. With everything that pretty is, my sweet lady, arise. 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 So get you gone. If this penetrate, I will consider your music the better. If it do not, it is a vice in her ears, which horsehairs and calves guts, nor the voice of unpaved eunuch to boot can never amend. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so let's see if that, yeah, that looks better. <clears throat> so for those of you who are like, nah, Shakespeare's boring and old and stuffy. I just want to reiterate, if you can penetrate her with your fingering, so we'll try with tongue too. Pals, Shakespeare's dirty and gross. <laughs> Shakespeare is dirty and gross and so full of... I don't even know if I can call this innuendo, Swan. I, I think we have, uh, I think we've tipped past the point of innuendo. <laughs> I think, I think it's what I, and again, like the way you describe this character, I imagine this is him thinking he's being very subtle and innuendo, and you're just like, nah, buddy, you, <laughs> you're not though. <laughs> and like, <laughs> it just, oh my gosh. and it's all music. It's all music terms. Yep. Yep. Like it's all musician terms. You know, you got that that fingering, you got uh if it can penetrate through the walls of her bedroom door, which have been shut to me because she wants nothing to do with me. Uh we'll try with tongue too. We're gonna sing as well. Like we're playing instruments and we're singing. And like, yeah, on the surface. And this is one of those things that so the opening of Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. I, so when I teach Romeo and Juliet, it's really tough because um, the opening of Romeo and Juliet with like Samson and Gregory um, is really vile. Like it's really, it talks about essentially sexual assault in okay. terms of the family feud. And so it's really tough to put that. I usually like skip it. I usually start with the, the street brawl and we get right into it because that's not, you know, there's a lot, that's wrapped up in that, that for these kids, for their first interaction with Shakespeare, I want it to be like kind of action guided and paced. And then, um, but there's so much that if you read that scene, you don't necessarily internalize those innuendos. Like you don't, okay. um, like it talks a lot about maidenheads. Mm, and if you're mm -hmm. in the mindset of Shakespeare, you're like, okay, like, oh, you hear the word maiden first, right? Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot that can be missed there. Um, then you get to the nurse and it's like, oh, the Mercutio is like, oh, the, the prick of my dial is at noon. <laughs> and those are harder to ignore. Yep. Yet still a room full of, of kids might not catch it because yes. they've either tuned out or because they have you know, uh, they're not really like invested or listening or whatever. Um, this, <laughs> I don't really think you can, I don't think there's any way to read it besides very sexually. Yep. Yep. No, I agree completely. <laughs> so like, so on first reactions from you. Ah, <laughs> uh, just, really funny and also like not shocked because I am like my sensibilities are offended but it's just just the shock of what Shakespeare is portrayed as to the world versus what he actually is I was just like oh no like you said he's dirty he's gross yeah. and especially with the lead up that you gave to this character that you know this is someone who it's a plot he's literally trying to woo someone who's already married but also at the same time like again to be very crude like he literally woke up with his morning wood and he like you know what she wants musicians at 6 a.m and me we're gonna hit her with both and just like no <laughs> no please no <laughs> please no and it's so i mean anyone any of 
of you out there in chat, all of you watching, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to be woken up by someone that you have no interest in trying to woo you through your bedroom wall? Or like, it's that, it's that boom box outside the window, right? Mm -hmm. But it's before you've woken up and it's not something that you're in love with. <laughs> yeah. Like how many of you would be like, oh yeah, I changed my mind. You know what? Cloton really is. He's, he's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, is, oh, go ahead. Uh, the other thing is that he's not even the one who plays and sings. Right. He's had to hire musicians. <laughs> also drag them out of bed. <laughs> yep. I mean, musicians, they got hustle. Yeah, They're I was like, going to say. You want me here at 6 a.m.? I will be here at 6 a.m. <laughs> I also imagine with them, like, they were probably up late playing, like, last night's show and everything. They're like, we'll just stay up. So they've actually been up for, you know, 18 hours at this point or much more. But I feel yep. like this is very much the, again, what we've moved into. And when we talked about it on the episode of In Addition, like, this is the you up text at like two in the morning like this is this doesn't feel like it's coming from a place of genuine love or interest to me like this feels very like i would like attention now please mm -hmm. <laughs> please please pay attention to me please pay attention to me and like so much of it um and you know to go deeper into the character and stuff I, it's hard to tell how much of it is like cloton actually wants to be with imogen or wants to like woo her for himself versus the influence of his mother who's been like you will marry this girl and so like i don't know i cloton is a terrible character he's just so oh my god uh, you know he doesn't understand the meaning of the word no Ugh, okay and he's also being so pressured by his mother to not accept a no so like there's so much nuance there that like um is really it's really tough with this guy um and he's so easily manipulated by his mom that i think that's a lot of the you know reason that he's pushing for this and uh i will say that in the follow-up scene when imogen does come out of her room and have a conversation with him she gives him one of the greatest like shakespearean insults uh um. that you could where she basically says um uh, I'll have to find the exact quote, but it's basically like his meanest garment, meaning like her husband posthumous, mm -hmm. his like most insignificant piece of clothing is worth better than is worth more than you because it has touched his body and it has been part of him. Oh, so like, that's so um, good. Yeah. And he just fixates on this and fixates and fixates and fixates and fixates like it, he won't let it go. And uh, yeah, he's not as dear as, as Posthumus's meanest garment. So then it eventually goes to this whole thing where he dresses in Posthumus's clothes to go <laughs> find her in the countryside, gets his head chopped off. Spoiler alert. She sees the clothes and is like, that's my husband's body for oh. sure. And then, uh, you know, Shakespeare stuff ensues. She thinks he's dead. He thinks she's dead. All that. All that. Um, so so many misidentified deaths <laughs> yep it's wild oh um, my goodness so his meanest garment that ever hath but clipped his body is dearer in my respect than all the hairs above thee were they all made such men his meanest garment that like his like his posthumous his undies are more <laughs> precious to me than your human presence ever could be <laughs> and it's so good um god she's so oh in a terrible predicament and also she's does not hold anything back from him oh and again <sighs> i like that i like that so often from what you've showed me that shakespeare gives some of his female characters really great command over their language. And even like you said, even though she's in a predicament, even though she's going through stress, like there is still a, a control of her words, which also taking into, into account when it was written and the roles of women at that time. So to not 
minimize her to still let so many of his female characters have the control and the bite and all of that. Like, and I, I think of the, when we were talking about the wedding scene from last episode where uh, Beatrice is lamenting the fact that there's nothing she can do because she's a woman, but you know, she's still, she's still laying out stuff with her words and still in control of that, even though she's distraught. And I yep. like that. I like that yeah. a lot. And I'll say too, there's a bit in this scene and this gets like, um, this transitions into where it's hard to believe that Shakespeare was not a woman because <laughs> this exchange, um, Clotin says, still, I swear I love you. And she just kind of goes off on like this weird, like gibberish tangent. If you but said so, twere as deep with me. If you swear still, your recompense is still that I regard it not. And he says, this is no answer. Cause it's not, it is a roundabout that says nothing. And her response like gives me goosebumps. Um, she says, but that you shall not say I yield being silent. I would not speak. Ooh. I pray you spare me. Like. She knows that as a woman, if she says nothing, that's consent in his mind in this time. And he has not listened to her say flat out, no, absolutely not. Right. So like she knows that she has to keep talking and not, you know, like to, so that he doesn't misinterpret her silence as, as consent. As, and that, right. Like, how oh, that's is oh. not a woman. That's so good. Because how many, you know, and again, Swan and I have talked about this um, first and third Mondays on uh, <laughs> TV slash in uh, Almost Daily Pod. We do a, a talk show and we discussed this. You know, we talked about uh, scariest moments of our lives that happened just because of, of who we are. Uh, in a situation that a man is never going to have to think about the same things and or not never but like more rarely and that response to me is just so it's one of the reasons that I love this play so much because it's so it has such an understanding of that position of being in that position and I just don't uh, it's bonkers to me that he was not a woman <laughs> you know yeah yeah, Whoa. just the level of in touch and understanding of some of that is, and especially like, again, you know, thinking about a lot of people being able to relate to certain circumstances or certain situations because of their proximity to women. So they'll say like, I didn't understand until my sister was attacked or something yep. happened to my mom and something like that. And I feel like he's not getting a ton of like females around at the theater, obviously, because all the female roles are played by men. So this is like, again, you, aside from whatever female companions he was keeping and his wife, like, I don't feel like he had a ton of females around him to glean this information from. So it's almost that much more impressive that you've got that insight for yeah, not having that support. So, Swan, how in touch with are you with the authorship debates that happen about Shakespeare? Uh, I'm and aware. You, okay. I, but I don't know a lot. <laughs> okay. So basically like there are a lot of people who, and it drives me up a gosh darn wall. Cause there are people who are like, um, Shakespeare, like William Shakespeare was the son of a glove maker who didn't have a high education so how could he write all of these amazing plays like there's just no way and i'm like oh my god you think someone needs to be rich and highly educated to be a genius to have or artistic to talent the human spirit have artistic mm -hmm. talent like it just it boggles my mind and it makes me so mad and a lot of people you know pull from like history and and oh, he's never, how could he have ever traveled to Italy? And he writes about it a lot. Like, I don't know, how could you ever be so far up your butt? But like, <laughs> it really does boggle the mind yeah. how one gets so um, far up there. And there are people, so basically there are people who like think that it was the Earl of whatever, Earl of, I don't know. Some people think it was Francis Bacon. Um, there was a movie called Anonymous um, that was directed by Roland Emmerich who did 
um, day after tomorrow, I think. Okay. Uh, basically, it was about, oh, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. That's who it was. Um, and, like, his whole premise is, like, the man Shakespeare could never have been smart enough, so it had to be someone in hiding pretending to be Shakespeare. And it was just a, a train wreck. It was uh, so obnoxious. But th all that to say, there is another authorship debate that isn't really founded in a lot of research yet or um, tons of scholarship. And a lot of these, a lot of these pretentious debag academics, author, authorian, whatever they are, um, will ignore this because the it supports the idea that a woman was Shakespeare. Um, Amelia Bassano, who was in a family of musicians in Venice, um, just her name, like Amelia, is a character in Othello, who um, is in Venice. Uh, also, Bassanio is a character in the merchant of venice um hmm. so like there's a lot of play with her name there's a lot of play with like where she was in the circle she was one of um england's first published female poets okay um, and it's basically like a feminist poetry book disguised as biblical <laughs> it's she is one of the most fascinating um characters i mean people she's a she's a person uh but like one of the most fascinating people in history that I've ever come across. And there was a whole play in London a couple of years ago called Amelia that takes this idea that she is Shakespeare's dark lady. So it casts Amelia through three stages of her life as a black woman living in Renaissance England. Ooh. And I swear I sobbed my freaking brain out during that play because it's all about standing up for your self-expression and being able to write and take your power back and like in this world run by men and it threw it like she has an affair with Shakespeare and he basically steals all her words and you know puts it on stage as his and it's all about losing that power the only power she had was her words and now those have been stolen from. like it's a beautiful beautiful play um basically it centers around the idea of uh if they're putting you on trial for being a witch, burn them down before they can light the fire. Like, oh, wow. It just, it is a burn the world down type of play, which if y'all know me at all. <laughs> yeah, so weird that that spoke to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a burn it down kind of girl. Um, so that's the authorian uh, debate that I can get behind. <laughs> You want to talk to me about Amelia Bassano writing some of Shakespeare's plays or influencing Shakespeare's plays? That conversation I'll have with you. Because being so in touch with those emotions, like, feels right, right? Yeah. Um, so from that, I was kind of curious to, to ask you a little bit about women in comics. Ooh, because it's not, okay yeah because it's not something that like i know a lot about and i know that a lot of of the, the like my tangential knowledge of comics really kind of touches on like the marvel dc genres or not yeah. genres but like you know that superhero yep idea and i don't see a lot of women characters or and i don't know if there are a lot more more female uh artists or authors out there but like I just kind of wanted a, some insight into that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so it's, it is like so many industries that didn't start, didn't have an infancy founded by women. A lot of them were not always the easiest place for women to get into. Now, again, there are, there are constantly exceptions to the rules. Um, you know, there's a, and I'm going to blank on her name and I, I'm so sad about it, but like there was a woman who was an early, I think she was a prop maker and designed and did a ton of stuff for like the monsters in Hollywood and like that stuff. And she was again, unsung hero. There were, there were females who worked at the studios early on, just like there were females who worked at the studios at Disney early on. But when you talk about the golden age of Disney or the golden age of comics, you're talking about a lot of like in Disney, it's the nine old men. It's literally these nine men who were there at the same time who did all of this stuff. And in no way does this diminish the amazing things that they did because right. they were. And it was, it's that incredible 
lightning strike where eight guys or nine guys got to be in the same place at the same time, had the same passion, you know, reincarnated or whatever. It all lined up. The planets aligned and you got this great thing. And, but what's tough is because of, so we'll say moving into the initials comics coming out. So you've got Superman and obviously all of that, like Batman, Batman recently celebrated 75 years. So he's been around for a while, but Wonder Woman doesn't come out until much, much later. And even some of that, like, there's a lot of crazy history in that with the guy who wrote her, which I can't even get into all of, but it's, there's some, again, who was writing it? Who was driving that? What were the motivations behind these things? Sure. Um, but a lot of then the stories that you're getting are meant to be catered to men. That was right. kind of the part and kids. And I think of little boys, but there is a whole huge chunk of romance comics from the early days of of comic books coming out before it was so much superheroes like superheroes really didn't have a strong foothold for a while because there were there were thrillers there were mysteries there were crime comics there were suspense there was the romance and they were all part of it and obviously then also working to distance themselves from comic strips which were syndicated and handled a much different way so you're trying to break like what is what is the value of letting my kid buy this comic where you know something might appear in the newspaper so you needed those engaging characters and as it evolves you have some really great artists really great writers working on it but anytime like any industry especially creative industries anytime they fall in hardship or the money isn't being generated by the sales you get a lot of cutbacks and any book that's not selling well gets let go but also it means that there's not as many opportunities for a diverse amount of people in it where i'm hoping we're moving towards is now you're seeing more absolutely more writers absolutely more artists who are female but you're seeing more females in the editorial positions Got the, it. the editors who are literally in charge of cultivating the information putting writers and artists together doing all of that like that's where women in positions of power within these big companies are starting to affect more change and you start to see more focus on we'll say multifaceted elements of characters yeah. and again i've read superhero comics for a long time i love a great big battle i am here for a great big battle but i'm not here for female characters only being one way and i'm sorry this is gonna be a very long-winded answer um no this is what I want. that's exactly what i wanted i mean you i went on a 20 minute tangent about it, uh so so again um if you want to talk like big big turning points in comic history going through different things golden age and where there's a changeover between the the comics code authority um where all of a sudden it's not specifically censored but it's that again it's the holding on to the the pleasantville and the suburban like picture of american life and what we can do so you can't have a comic that shows you know it's archie and it's nothing against archie they've been, they're still going so they've got something that works but you can't show gritty death you can't Unless you're the cw right <laughs> you take it fly in the face of all of that <laughs> Yeah. But then like you get up to a certain point and you get something like Alan Moore's Watchmen, which is incredibly gritty and incredibly dark and a very not subtle like take on a superhero genre. Sure. And from there, then you start to see like where. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Comics go to authority um, to some kid in chat. You start to see a lot more diversity in some of the grittiness that comes out to the benefit and to the detriment with anything, but you at least have options. And, <laughs> but in all of that, you rarely see female artists being featured on big books, being featured as writers. And it was very much a guy's club for a really, really long time. 
And like that makes sense to me, seeing all of the the women superheroes who are just sexualized versions of the male superheroes, like that, it makes sense that these are, there's a whole great thread on the internet that it's like uh, men describe, male authors describing women. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> I love it and hate it simultaneously, but it's it's amazing because it's, yeah. it's accurate. It's so ridiculous. But like, that's how comics have always felt to me when I see women in them. Um, and so like it's good to know that that's that is changing as you know things must and will and should um that that's that that these characters are getting more nuance and more yes uh and it's what i think what i think is exciting is there is change and also you talk about comics being able to adapt to the new way of things so the 90s was a big turning point and kind of a crash for comics because you had gone to a point where anything from golden and silver age of comics was very valuable because there weren't a lot of them printed and now all of a sudden you're getting into more essentially mass market printing so people are buying so many copies of these books because they want to score big on a collectible item but because you have so many of them printed they're not worth anything and so because the numbers on paper say that we're doing great we should make more when that bubble burst, it's it was very like shaky numbers because it wasn't real. I don't want to say real collectors, but it wasn't an accurate number of the people who collected. It was people buying two or three of the same issue because they wanted it for a collector's thing. So since that changeover and since the internet made it available for webcomic artists mm -hmm. and people to self-publish, you are now getting, and even breaking off and getting a company like Image where their whole thing was, I want to own my characters, I want to have control over them. That even though, you know, again, if I'm at Marvel and I'm drawing Spider-Man, I never own Spider-Man. I don't own any of the art, I don't own any of the story, I am drawing it for them. So I want to have these characters that I can choose what I do with. And as you get that, you start to see more female creators being included in the process. But it's tough because I think what I saw a lot of it was the statement being the sexualized women are for the guys and these super macho men are for the girls. And that was the, I think, a failing in understanding of what your consumer actually wanted. That's like, no, because unfortunately, the super jacked up guys doing crazy testosterone things that's still for you it's still for the guys it's still for the male audience that's yes. not i'm like i enjoy a hero who is strong i oh there's a great thing where it was literally a side by side of hugh jackman during the time he was playing wolverine and is jacked out he's got the cover on men's health is him without his shirt on all ripped like super high contrast so you can see how muscly is the cover of him on like women's health or whatever the the female one was him in a light blue sweater, like holding a puppy. And I was like, this should tell you. Yeah, everything <laughs> you need to know. So it's there, there's a strong movement. There is, there is a lot of hold on to the old guard that still exists in comics. Of course, of course. And that sucks, but what I am hopeful for now being around it for 10 years is there is an incredibly strong community within it who not only are feeling confident to speak up with some of the injustices and issues re relating to this and the idea of the old guard that it's just a old white dude's game, mm -hmm. but also there's a support for new creative talent, for stories about trans people, for stories about the alphabet mafia to <laughs> uncover LGBTQ plus everything. Like, all of these different stories of female-led books of this and not just female-led pinup books but actual female-led stories that are captivating and interesting yeah i and that's and that's amazing to me and it's something that seeing the evolution of that is really cool because with shakespeare um it's not changing the source material is never going to change and yet the world around Shakespeare is changing. And that old guard that you talk about in comics is the same exact thing that happens in Shakespeare. It's all, it's an old white man's game. And that is changing because people are 
it's it's like there's a transition of the way that people are reading the plays and that's so important because when you find quotes like i just read from cymbeline um that have such a nuanced understanding of a woman's place and a woman's position and so much fight against that you read it in a different way when yes. you're a man and it is a man's game that quote isn't going to resonate but as soon as you have a woman on your production staff that says this and this is the quote this is the piece like that starts to it starts to change and we're starting to see more women in creative positions in Shakespeare and it's like exactly what you were saying that power dynamic is starting to shift and change um I was talking to a woman who runs a it's a podcast called women in Shakespeare yeah very straightforward <laughs> And we, uh, we were talking a little bit and she was like, I am trying to put together like a round table for the spring because there are so many like Shakespeare podcasts are it's a field dominated by women. And considering the fact that podcasts are typically uh, like it's a male dominated field. Um, Shakespeare, typically a male dominated field. Now we see like this this. Venn diagram of Shakespeare podcasts and the per, the highest person it's it's mostly women creating Shakespeare podcasts and so like talking about why we think that is and how that is changing the dynamic and the power and um the way that we read the plays and because the source material is never going to change we have to keep rereading the plays in a new light yeah so it's kind of the same thing. It's mirroring the same journey as you're saying that comics are doing, but like, it's wild to me that your source material is changing. Like you are creating new work every single day. And so are we in Shakespeare, but like the source text never changes. Yeah. Well, and so that's, there's a fascinating, I think, comparison when it comes to we'll say the established characters so i mentioned superman i mentioned batman and so the again the debate about it is or, or even spider-man i'm trying to think of characters who almost anybody who even if you don't read comics mm -hmm. you know who they are and you know their story yeah um do you have to every time you tell a spider-man story do you have to watch him see uncle ben die that was what was so mind-blowing about uh into homecoming. the spider verse the oh one? also home yes uh so what was it homecoming far from home oh no i can't remember the first yes but yes the yeah. first tom holland yeah the first tom holland spider-man because he already was spider-man and we already saw him as spider-man in civil war so like we didn't yep. have to get an origin story and it was so much more of an interesting story because we've all seen and i was not a um comics or superhero person before I watched through all of the MCU and decided I was definitely a superhero person. <laughs> um, but like, I had seen friggin' Spider-Man get bit by a spider and watch Uncle Ben die 15 different times in 15 different ways. Yep. Tell a new story, tell a new version of the same story. Yep. Give us a new and lens to see it through. Absolutely. And that's, again, what I think is super, super cool is the conversation around comics that's happening that and there was a whole again i won't get into it because it is i don't know for some reason it's a very sensitive topic for me because it is one of those that really bothers me and that's the it's a, it's called the woman in the fridge type thing and it's to simplify it it is the the only way to force your character to have a not just an arduous journey but a very strong, like emotional, broken phoenix rising from the ashes is to have something horrible like rape or actual death happen to their female love interest, either their wife or their girlfriend or their like, that's how you show this character becoming a new and avenging and all this stuff. And it was just, it was so frustrating to me because like so many things, it felt like it resigned all of the female characters to not only sidekicks, but set dressing. That your goal is now meant to be there so that something bad happens to you to have the male character react to it. And and even to follow that point a little bit more, it was if you if you wanted to show 
a damaged female character, it was the same thing. She had to have experienced a sexual assault or something like that. And that was the only way to show like, well, that's why she is this way. You know, that's why she's avenging and killing men. It's like, yep. for my sarcastic take on it now, it's lazy. But also, it lacked, again, I would say a female perspective. That I was like, there are, so, <laughs> in a really morbid way, there's so many ways you can be damaged. Uh, it's not just that. But also, like, you need to give these female characters as much thought as you do with what's happening to the male characters. Also, aren't you bored? Aren't you bored that every time you want to write an emotional male character, you have to kill his female love interest? Like, aren't you tired? I'm tired. <gasps> well, that's why I, like, I didn't like Wonder Woman. I didn't like either Wonder Woman. And it's because it was still a story about Chris Pine. Like, it wasn't ever between one and two. Both of them were stories about Chris Pine. They were not stories about Wonder Woman. And I say that, and then I say, well, good. I cannot like a movie, but please give me more female-directed, female-starring superhero movies. <laughs> give me a thousand superhero movies starring women, directed by women, written by women, so that I can dislike them. Yes. Like, yes. That that thing, I, oh, I was just talking about this recently, where it was the... <sighs> The visuals of Wonder Woman made me happy. Like, seeing Themyscira, really cool. Very exciting. But it was, like you said, it was incredibly hard to be critical of the issues I took with the movie. Because they're like, well, this is why we don't make female-led superhero movies. I was like, no. I want you to make so many of them that this one can be criticized because I have so many to choose from that I can be like, yes, but here's one that did it really well. Like... The amount, the freedom to just make like the seventh Die Hard movie, the 15th Fast and the Furious movie. Like, that's what I want for female superheroes. Like, I just yes. want it could be bad and it's Wonder fine. Wonder Woman 2 was bad. Make a Wonder Woman 3, do it. Make a Wonder yep. Woman 7 so that I can hate them. And it's not an admonishment of every woman led superhero movie. Like, yep. That's, that's not like, ah, yep. And it's that, it's that exact way with still with the female led superhero books. And then there are times where like, it's so frustrating because if you don't make the hole in one on your one shot, that is then justification to pull your funding. And that, that's heartbreaking. And that's the part that I want to see changing more. Yeah. That. And twice as much for uh films and books and uh, stories for people of color like yes a million times more important and like this but with the same reasoning behind it like those you don't just get a black panther like that's not enough <laughs> that's yep. not it's not a one and done type thing and like there's just like let them fail let them be mass produced and put mi millions of dollars into them for them to not be good for those films to not be good that's fine do another yep. one yep it's just this and i feel like that industry is starting with in the tiniest tiniest ways to see that change and i just need it to happen better and faster yes yeah, so I I am I count myself very lucky uh, <laughs> in many ways and then not in a way. Like if I had my my dream, you know, I would have been born at a time where I could have been, you know, one of the female staffers who worked on like Batman the Animated Series. I wish I'd been born earlier enough so that in my career I could have had that chance because while there are still shows like that, it's not the same. Like I would have liked to have been a part of that. But uh where we are at now, even attending Comic-Con as a female artist has changed. And I keep coming back to so much what I see in the mirrors of the podcasting community, yeah. that the good people in the community stand with each other. They hype up each other. They, they support each other and 
that idea where now if you have a female creator that you like, you either not only hype her stuff, but if you have more reach and more power, you use that to bring her onto a book. Like you have these artists who are like, this is talent, I see it, I'm bringing it forward and showing it because I have a voice that people will listen to. And then, and again, what I think is cool about art is there is a lot of it that <laughs> you could be a really shit human and still make great art and still get hired. Uh, but a lot of these people are very good people, but it's, you are judged on the merit of your art. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got someone, like if you're submitting your portfolio and it's a blind look, like there's kind of that nice thing where again, hopefully if they're not just looking at the name first and they're looking at the art, that this is the art we're looking for, then it doesn't matter who's attached to it because you're judged on the artwork that you're producing. And I right. like, I want that. I want to be judged on my merits. Like I want you to hire me because you liked my art, not because you needed to hire a woman, not because you needed this. Like, you hired me because yeah. that's what you want. And that yeah. was the end of the conversation. Yeah. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> well, I mean, I do too. And it wasn't even in my plan to like go down this road today. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to talk about <laughs> trying to bring some sexy time. Um, <laughs> but this whole scene and this whole play um, is there are like some really terrible men in this play. And yet there's such an honest uh female understanding in it as well so like it was just kind of like as i was thinking through it it kind of sparked that um let's bring it back to sweet dumb <laughs> sweet yes. big dumb cloten i can't even say sweet big dumb cloten uh <laughs> <laughs> because i one of the reasons i wanted to bring this too is i wanted to see your i wanted to see your idea of who cloten is and so i want to go back to <laughs> I want to go back to like this situation. He's at her door at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., whatever. Um, and he has this whole big thing about penetrating and fingering <laughs> and tonguing and <laughs> um, and then doesn't do any of it. So like how as an artist do you take that? Because like he's in charge of the scene. He's in control of the scene. And yet he's not the one doing anything. Okay. Like when you have a main character who's in control and in charge, but then the musicians are the ones that actually do stuff. Right. How do you, uh, what do you do? I, so what I, well, again, what I chose to do in this is, and it's the fun of sometimes having background characters. And because it's built in that the, the minstrels are going to be there. So you almost have the opportunity to put, the audience into those specific characters so you can make them react how you want the audience to be reacting. So they're my, they're my chorus. They're, they are my like, so, and I, I can't wait, like I, <laughs> now I'm, I've collected them into a trio. So now in each shot that I show them, I'm gonna keep them in that little trio because you're going to get three separate reactions to what this person is saying. And also like their feeling so you get to have then i think it frees up this main character to be this big like all talk all show no action and them kind of being like okay <laughs> okay that's gross but all right like and i you could play it two ways because you could play for me i thought that was funnier i thought it was funny that if the joke is on i can't say his name but the big main character the big dumb boy um <laughs> so, dumb dummy. Yeah, so if the musicians are laughing at him too, that's what I want. So again, I have control over how you feel about this character by how the additional characters in the scene are reacting to him. Because if they're cheering him on and be like, yeah, and making like lewd finger movements and stuff like that, like that's a whole different feel to the scene. Yeah, I was like, eh. <laughs> I don't want to get terms of service on Twitch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> get banned. Today's the day I get banned. Um, so. Are they, are over they his Shakespeare. Honestly, over Shakespeare? That would be the funniest. That would be so perfectly <laughs> poetic and beautiful to me. But if sorry, we went out, nope. If we went out on Shakespeare, that would be, that would, I would, that wouldn't be too sad. That'd be a good way to go. But it's the, again, so they're either his bros who are cheering him on or they are what I think because I'm rooting for the female character because I think this character's in the wrong. They're the skeptical 
they are they're the ones who are just like we're here it's our job but we don't have to love what you're doing Mm -hmm. uh so for me that made more sense like that's how i wanted to play them in the scene but also when you have them being a little bit more deadpan and not giving as much like i'm pushing it to him being like he's leaning on the door like he's turning around and making kissy faces like (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah I, i might even have him stick his tongue out like he can be this over the top and lewd thing that he's saying and yet, like, it's not everybody cheering him on. Like, it's literally like, you know, and here now he's getting down on his knees and he's offering up the musicians to her. Like, they're like, we're just here, guys. We're just, uh, I wish we didn't get up for this, but we need the coin. Like, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I like that. And uh, and again, what, what we keep coming back to, which I think is so cool, is a lot of it is left up to interpretation when it comes to the Shakespeare stuff that you've brought me. Like, even when we talked about last week at the wedding, you know, is is the joking sincere or is the joking malicious? Or at one point, you know, is her asking to kill somebody? Like, is she just testing him? Is she serious? Like, there's a lot of different ways to play it. And I think that's the fun of it. And I think it's why it works. I think yep. it's why then you get to, you know, put your own take on these characters. And, and so, yeah, so I, again, using additional background characters to essentially fill out the scene lets me play with the emotions of the audience a little bit. Yeah. So that's, it's funny because that's exactly what directing does too. (laughs) When, if I have these three and I would also probably pick three because three is a very good number because what three does to me is it allows two of the characters to be like, Oh my God, this guy. And then it allows that third character to be like, the <laughs> finger ache. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Did you, did you guys hear that? Did you just hear him say? <laughs> um, and like the other two to be like, shut up, man, shut up. So you still have a majority of like, you know, the majority of the audience who's going to see this and be like, ew, this guy, what <laughs> is he doing? And then you have the, you know, teenage boys in the audience or like the, the anyone with the mind of a teenage boy who yep. will be that like, <laughs> He did, did he just, he just, he just, okay, Okay, Shakespeare. Um, So you've got that trio of characters that is balanced in that way. So you're still giving um, precedence to the majority of like how people should be reacting to the character while acknowledging that they are allowed to laugh at the sexy time jokes. Yes, Uh, that's a huge thing. It's, it's giving them, giving them permission to find it funny. Not necessarily agreeing or encouraging it, but being allowed to laugh at the mm-hmm. situation, which I think, right. again, it's, I think with directing, with with this type of stuff, there is nothing wrong with your goal being to guide the audience to feel a certain way. Kind of feel like that's to. the point. <laughs> like, you have to. It, with, with Shakespeare, if they're not understanding every word that comes out with uh, comics, that they don't have a ton of words, like you have to lead them to their you know what you have to manipulate their emotions in the best way you can like that's our job yeah as, <laughs> as directors and and authors like that's the the point is to make the audience feel the way you want them to feel yeah without uh too heavily dictating or manipulating like you got to give them some options and yes because, like, one of my, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dear Evan Hansen. Yes, musical. I am. Um, it, that, to me, feels like a musical that is spending the entire time saying, if you're not crying in the audience, you're a bad person. Ooh, okay. Because of the the subjects that it, it, it feels so emotionally manipulative in a bad way to me. Um, and I have a lot of problems with, like, the subject matter anyway. Um, but there's a lot of emotional manipulation in a way that I dislike. It's like a really fine balance of letting the audience decide and guiding them while guiding them. And then, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Um, but like saying, this is how you should feel right now. Or this yes. Is how you must feel right now. 
so it's interesting to me, especially with Dear Evan Hansen. So I've not actually watched the show. I've only ever listened to the music. And the actual like composing of the music, I think is beautiful. And a lot of the songs are brilliant. Yeah. It's gorgeous. But also like the same thing with Hamilton. Like when you get to the end of, you know, quote unquote disc two, like it's sad. And it's been sad for a good chunk of the second half of the play. And Dear Evan Hansen is the same way, but I absolutely agree with you that they are, I feel like in comparison to Rent, which still has some levity and has some light and has some of that, but also almost they're not hitting, like they're hitting home how terrible everything is, but at the same time, they're not telling you to feel really bad. Mm -hmm. They just succeed in making you feel really bad. I but I feel like is Evan Sorry, Hansen is just like, no, you have to, you will feel bad. You feel bad because this is a bad thing and bad things happen and you feel mm -hmm. bad. I, it, even as just someone who's listened to it, it feels much more, this is how you feel, period. It feels prescripted. Prescriptive? Yes. Prescriptive. Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, Rent and he, even Hamilton, like in um, Stay Alive or in um, uh, whatever song Eliza has that's very, very sad. Like, I am watching Eliza lose it. And that is what makes me cry uh watching uh i'll cover you reprise i can't even talk about it without crying uh this will yeah. not be the second stream i cry on today folks <laughs> you're not gonna get me um but seeing the characters feeling these emotions so deeply and so profoundly is what affects me um music and i don't mean to i do mean to bash on dear evan hansen it won all of the tonys when great comet should have so I'm, i'll never forgive it but uh, <laughs> I don't mean to harp on just that one musical because there are a ton of um, examples in, in other shows as well, but it feels very directed and prescriptive rather than felt on stage. Yes. Um, but I also haven't seen it live, so I can't necessarily. And it it's tough too with that one because I know like the guy who was like famously played the lead is someone I really like. Like, I think he's talented. I think he's a good actor. He's I'm sure he, he killed it because he's that good. But again, I think you can still, like so many things, you can still be critical of the material that a good actor is performing. Mm -hmm. I can still say like, nope, I didn't like how that made me feel because you didn't give me options. Yeah, we can be critical of a musical that uh, discusses mental health in a kind of unhealthy way and still say, give us more musicals about mental health. It's the same exact thing. Like, let us be critical of things and still give them to us. This isn't one, uh, one and done. Exactly. Exactly. Oh man. He looks like a butthole. <laughs> oh, his hair. He's got butthole hair. Oh, oh yeah. my He's... goodness. <laughs> you said meathead and I was like, I know exactly how I'm going to draw yeah. him. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's fun. He's such a ding dong. <laughs> and this is something I think is really interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> It's not the same future X skeleton. It's not the same. It, he, it's way more bouffant on him. Here, I'll bring it up a little bit. Yeah, more. it's me. It's it's more of a ding dong haircut on Clo <laughs> and than it is on you. You are uh, very handsome. He looks like a butthole. Yes. Uh, so I think it's funny. So you talk about um, we'll say something like resting bitch face in a female actress. That honestly, like however your face rests, or in that's a how female your face person. <laughs> or a female person um you can have that on screen and still have that actor then as soon as they come to life and emote change how you feel about that character all of these different things but with comics and any static art because these characters aren't going to move if i'm going to give characters certain facial features or expressions i kind of need to be careful because it's going to inform what you think of him so mm -hmm. i'm giving him you know like half slanty eyes and kind of a smirk because that's who he is and even if i then again show show the female side of this and her being frustrated like it's still important to be mindful of the the images that you get to show these emotions because it's informing that whole character just from the face and and so part of the character design and and again it's fun in these because i'm doing it on the fly mm -hmm. and just you know whatever i would first think of the character 
And that's why you have editors to go back and, you know, look over things again and, and do all of that and get a second look in case you missed something with how a character yeah. looks. But yeah, it's, again, I think in the, like we'll say in stage acting or in movies, that type of direction, you can, you can play with the emotions on a face a lot more um, freely because you have room to do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, He's a butthole. What? Now, can I ask you this? What? Because um, mm -hmm. it looks like you're going Renaissance in costume. Yes. Yes. What drove you to that look? Because, like, last time it was very, what, like, 20s, kind of deco-inspired? Yep. Uh, so this one was honestly because you said it had kind of fairy tale elements so I think I, again, it works really well in, we'll say like the art design of Disney Snow White, like that kind of, or even we'll say like Enchanted, which I think is even better because it's kind of, it's that mock Renaissance. It is, or even, you know, something like uh, Disney's Robin Hood or stuff like that. Like all of these very, like, it's, it's that same thing. It's of a time. It's not accurate, but you know, Enchanted worked so well that then even when you bring Amy Adams into real life, mm -hmm. like the outfits and everything that she's got, it fits because it's what we think of in like classical fairy tale fantasy. So yeah, again, yeah. it's uh, it's in the moment using a shorthand to try and convey a specific setting. So that way, you know, so this corridor, I was going back and forth. I was like, okay, so do I do, you know, something super modern or something like that? Or I was like, or do I kind of just play with generic fantasy or even something like tangled or like that type of mm -hmm. setting and and look so yeah yeah i mean it, and it worked perfectly like you were saying that kind of disneyfied uh mock renaissance feel and i had never really put that together um but that is exactly gosh enchanted is such a good movie it's so um, good James i feel Marsden. like it's underrated oh it's he's so underrated i don't hear anyone talk about it and i know that it's old but like James Marsden in that film is absolutely priceless. And oh, they're coming out with a second one. Oh, that's true. That's true. So hopefully we get a little resurgence of, of enchanted love. But like, yeah, that um, it is very Renaissance inspired, which is interesting. And I'm not sure where that came from. This would be a good um, viewers, listeners, if you all, if you have any idea, um, the progression of fairy tale costuming through Disney, how that progressed, like, because that Snow White, um, even Sleeping Beauty, like, you see the tunic with the leggings, and you see oh, yeah. the, the poof sleeves on the women, like, I'm actually really fascinated to see how it rooted itself in a more Renaissance style, um, coming from, if you look at the history of fairy tales, which is eternal, um, why that why that was the the style that they rooted into i'm actually really curious actually now. heck yeah <laughs> well and i think again it's it's very very cool because especially so i love the gothic story nature of sleeping beauty and the art design like that's always been one of my favorite art designs not necessarily a favorite of like this is the movie i love to watch i love to watch it because it's visually gorgeous mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. stunning and it's all of these you know incredible painted backgrounds and everything but i i wonder with some of that if it came from the illustrations that were being created around that time period like i'm thinking of like what the the monks were transcribing when you were when you were finally getting stories written down and illustrating them the illustrated text literally uh but like that's what i think of when i think of the again there it's floating around now as memes of all these like you know how to draw a cat right they're like yeah i know how to draw a cat yeah Doesn't like renaissance oil paintings just in general yeah so i'm wondering if it was influenced by again it's almost influenced by the art of the time whether that was actually accurate or not um but yes yeah that's that's interesting because like if we were starting to pub if we were starting to publish fairy tales and also because i'm just thinking like brothers Grimm, whether it is accurate or not i have a very specific image in my head of what those fairy tales look like 
uh, Hans Christian Andersen. I have a very specific idea in my head of what they look like. And I think that's a lot informed by publication of the, the children's books that had illustrations in them that showed me that like, I don't know if that's actually what it was meant to be, but that's what's in my head because that's the art that I saw attached to it. Yeah. That's, it's really fascinating. Um, I'm just going to keep like, I'm going to keep digging into that. Maybe we'll have a, an answer next month. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's, it's super cool to think about. There was an artist. Um, I think it's something like Shoom or something like that. She did a really cool series where she went in and resor researched and created historically accurate Disney princess art yes. so in all of their, like, this is the time period beauty and the beast is taking place. This is the undergarments that you would have had to wear because she's in France. And this was what was in fashion in France mm -hmm. at that time. Oh, and it's, oh, it's so good. But also you look at it, there's no way you could animate it. Those things are so complicated. It's so detailed. You'd never be able to animate it in a production setting to get it done. So I understand taking shortcuts to make it so that you can actually finish the project, even if it means it's not as historically accurate. Shumla, it looks like. Yes. This yeah. and these are absolutely stunning. So um, it's she's so good. Yeah, and it's really cool too because they're not that far off. Mm, nope, you can um, see the inspiration. Muscles. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's really really cool. I I had never really thought about that <laughs> progression before and how it kind of like rooted itself there, um, but now. I'm going to be thinking about it a lot. And <laughs> I love that. Um, it's kind of like how Shakespeare got rooted in the, uh, I think we talked about this last, last time, um, but that like timeless Branna, um, yep. out of time, white dresses and uniforms look, um, how that became kind of like Shakespearean because mostly because, and like you said, for, for animation, you can't afford to have these really elaborate, historically accurate designs. Yeah. That's for most Shakespearean productions. You can't afford to costume these things. I mean, a lot of places can, uh, but like most Shakespeare theaters are poor um, <laughs> and don't have the budget for, um, really really hyper stylized and that's the group down here that i work with do all historically accurate costuming oh wow like they do all renaissance because they were born out of a renaissance uh historical reenactment okay but, mm, i forgot what they're called it's the sca society for creative anachronism yes yes yeah it's something um, like that but yes i know exactly like what that. you mean <laughs> but it's all they make clothes they just make renaissance clothes and then those are the costumes and it's wild they're beautiful they're heavy and they're hot yeah. and in austin uh <laughs> yeah i can't imagine doing that <laughs> outside in austin in like eight layers yep um but they're absolutely stunning and then you know for me most of my stuff has been stylized in like my mom will say the folksy mumford and sons time period <laughs> You know, the time period of the Fleet Foxes, uh, which is kind of Victorian almost. Uh, okay. Or, because we do like, we have a set, and again, it's what we have in our costume closet as well, of which we re reuse because, again, we're poor. Mm. Um, so it's like a long, I don't know how to describe it, a long baby doll dress, you know, so it's cut right yep. under the bust but it goes down long. They're all white dresses with cap sleeves. And then we've got these like robes of all different colors that go over them and tie like right under the bust and have- Yep. Like, yeah, that's very, it's very Enchanted. like the evolution into Enchanted and the like the Regency era, getting the empire Regency. waist with the little, yeah. Yep. That's what it was. Um, very Regency look. And yeah, so um, in Enchanted, her green curtain dress. Oh, I love that kind of what we've based all of them off because we did a Disney show once and my mom made that and she's like, well, I know how to make this now. So I'm just going to make all the rest of them look like this. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. But they're beautiful and yeah. they feel Shakespearean without having to hammer in a specific time period. Yes. Yes. I think that that style of empire waste Regency dress, because also you look at 
again, I, <laughs> I love costuming and the history of clothes is so cool, but you look at a lot of, we'll say like Henry the eighth time period where you're getting in a lot of the Renaissance stuff. A lot of the undergarments aren't that dissimilar, like under, under, undergarments. Yes. But like the Shea and that type of stuff, like those under dresses were very similar for women. It was just the covering that you then put over them. So obviously Renaissance, if you're well-to-do, you're getting a lot more layers and robes and like things that would cinch around the midsection, but also having the flowing sleeves. As you move into the Regency era, all of a sudden you're not getting the full length robes necessarily, but you're getting almost just like the, it's essentially like a cropped jacket because that is hitting the same place as the empire waist and all of that. And so it's, you can see the progression of how they were doing it and where they came from and simplifying it and what changed a lot was the fabric they're making things out of, but not mm -hmm. necessarily the patterning, which yeah, so cool. <laughs> Obviously, I think it's cool because I can it happily talk cool. about it. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's we'll have to um we'll have to get my mom on one of these to talk about costuming and stuff. Uh, that would be awesome. She, I mean, she's made all of our costumes forever, but she has just such a cool sense of of style and what it's the same when you don't have a budget it's like what's going to be the most effective look for the least amount of work fabric etc so when you talk about um being as effective as possible with facial expressions in art it's kind of the same thing with costume like you've got one piece to make an impression and when you have a show with 30 actors in it you can't really afford more than one piece for <laughs> each person you can't afford to be changing and changing and changing and changing. Yeah. Um, so what's going to give the most visual impact? And you have to um, you have to make it clear what their position is, like what their rank is, what their wealth is, what their education is, what their status is in so many different ways. And man, I'm not good at that. I am, I, I do not have that vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, I think we've talked about what's very cool about comics being such a collaborative project yeah. it's very much the same as working with even if you are a small budget like you still have someone who is the director and kind of has the art direction but that's why you invest in people who understand costuming or can see it like if you've got the vision for it then that's a great resource and why obviously you know bigger places have entire departments dedicated to costuming why you know you'll have a whole staff for it the same with the lighting the same with the the scene builders you know that's the having a bunch of people who excel at certain things kind of all work in so as we'll talk about this as i finish a page and i can send it on to someone who can start coloring it and start inking it like i can be working on the next thing while they're working on that and that's how we get the book done in time yeah yeah it's good to yeah, collaboration is something that's tough for me um, because I'm a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> but like when there are areas that I'm just not good at, it's easier to be like, here, let me compartmentalize this for you and you can take charge on this because I just don't know. I just yeah. don't know. I'm excited. Um, I think that Cymbeline is going to be, you know, depending on how things go next year, depending on what kind of year it is, uh, it might be our next park show. Oh, that would so. be cool yeah and i really would love to i would love to hammer in these these fairy tale vibes and like to really have just the whole thing feel like a fairy tale because we're in this fairy tale park with these fairy tale bridges and fairy tale moat and like this fairy tale gazebo and like to have the whole play look so ethereal and but we would have to do we, you would have to be costumed and that's mm -hmm. the with the style of production I do, which is like get together the day before and throw it all together. It would be a lot harder to source those kinds of costumes for everything. Yeah, yeah, it would. Uh, it'd be interesting too, especially if you gave people like the specs of what you were looking for, and then had almost like their cosplay, like what mm -hmm. they could come up with, either what they had in their house or stuff like that. Like, I mean, again, you're not going to get as coherent of a vision, but it. Yeah, oh, uh, that could be really. Basically, just somebody give me a million dollars. Like, honestly, like, that's all I'm asking for. And I don't understand why it's so hard. <laughs> why is why is that so difficult? Just funnel all your money to me and I'll make good Shakespeare. <laughs> I love it. Also, I was thinking as I was drawing these characters, like, um, Gallivant, like the TV yes! show Gallivant. 
Galavan was so good. It was good. And again, like vaguely Renaissance, like kind of of a time period, but again, like just fun costumes that served served the fairy tale story. Oh my gosh. I loved God, Galavan. That, that, oh, that show was so fun. It was so silly and so stupid. Um, so, but so good. So good. Yep. Man, so that good. is a show I should rewatch. Well, I think that was one where, like, I kind of knew it was happening. I wasn't necessarily paying super close attention. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, aside from nostalgia and certain one like, Batman animated series intro, absolutely a bop. Batman Beyond's intro is a bop. But, like, that intro, like, the theme song of that, I think, is one of the best. And just... You could not be more in. After those two minutes, I'm like, I'm in. It's catchy. I'm going to keep singing it. You told me all the information to get me to this point. So I am ready to go. And I I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just, oh, I love it so, so much. You said Batman Beyond's theme song. And I know that it's Batman Forever is the one I'm thinking of. But all I could think of was Kiss from a Rose by Seal. And I was like, is that an official theme song? <laughs> it is a bop, though. I do love it, it is a bop. Uh, uh, Seal knows how to make a bop. Yes, he does. Uh, so good. You know who does not know how to make a bop? Chloe. <laughs> Bringing it all back around. Bringing it all back around. Um, one thing I think is interesting. Speaking of the actual song that they uh, that they sing. Um, let me make this bigger. It is so virginal in mm -hmm. its uh wording and in its tone and i think this is something also that like if you if you're making that trio of musicians really like if you have decided that they were in charge of the song that gets sung um i think that really contrasts cloton's words and his instructions with their personalities like even more because yes. um hark hark the lark at heaven's gate sings so already we have this like beautiful imagery, like this um, early morning golden ethereal tone that's been set. Uh, and Phoebus begins to rise. Um, so uh, now we've got Phoebus rising up, pulling the sun. His steeds to water at those springs on chaliced flowers that lies. And winking merry buds begin to ope their golden eyes. So we've got Phoebus in his carriage and the sun climbing up to heaven's gates with flowers. We Mary buds, like we've got that virginal Mary in there. Um, and the flowers are just starting to open and they're just, you know, open their golden eyes. They're just starting to wake up with everything that pretty is. My sweet lady, arise, arise, arise. And so you have on the surface this just like absolutely innocent, pure, everything that is good and light and golden. Um, and then like, and this is where you can decide, Cloten has, you know, written this song or decided the song to sing because you take this and it is so virginal and it is so beautiful and ethereal and all that. And then you dig into it more and you're like, okay, um phoebus skins arise like now we've got whenever you say the word arise and you have a more kind of sexual tone in your head starts to take on a different meaning yep now we have his seeds get to water at those springs we have this like image of like drinking this uh lapping up idea and now when you start talking about flowers opening it's a much less uh innocent and virginal peace yeah. right? i was gonna say that that has so much connotation attached to it yep Oof. so in just this one like little song that has no real like there's no reason to harp on it right like it's just a little a little piece it's a tool to get this scene progressing now we start to get into the nuance of like what is the story you're trying to tell here? And what is the tone you're going for? Are these musicians innocent and sweet and virginal and, uh, or are they just missing the point? 
Well, and too, like, I, I'm almost wondering, again, because uh, it's very cool in this. What scared me off before in the not understanding of Shakespeare, I now find, and again, why it's super fun to talk about, because it could be so many things, because there's not just a straightforward, it is this. And so there's part of my brain as you're reading it, I was like, okay, so if we spin it and we take the musicians as his bros, are they trying to help him out? Oh, no, I can't think of the very famous play where someone writes it for somebody else. Um, but uh, like, are they trying to be like, no, here's a much nicer way to say this. Like, you could still be lusty, but here, like, we'll make it pretty with flowers. And no, but you're still strong, like a stallion and all of that. Or again, is it like, oh God, he's asking us to do this. Like, just make something pretty. Like, mm -hmm. I would sing this to my lady. And yeah, like I, I again, you, with these background characters, and I don't, I'm assuming the, the, because they're not named, because they probably don't show up again, you know, you're not getting like clown or fool characters or even like sidekick characters. Like you're not getting that running commentary of the extra people. Like these are literally just set dressings for this scene. So you get to, Figure, like you get to spin them however you want and how you make them react and oh it's exciting yep yep and the idea of these musicians being huge bros is so funny to me and like that's an absolutely valid interpretation of these characters and the whole opposite is true as well like having them be innocent is also valid and justified by the text yeah and that's so cool <laughs> it's really exciting and i think again like having the option to play mm -hmm. like it's it's a sandbox and you get to play and have this story told kind of how you want it and oh yeah it's just exciting i love yeah. how horrified these boys look <laughs> these poor sweet just... boys and their sweet dumb faces it's so <laughs> funny to me i love it i just i have again like uh, I don't know if this is just me and because I, I like adding silly characters all throughout, but like it lets, even though he, the big dumb guy is still going to be the focus, he's always going to be the main character, but to be able to have fun with just like these background characters, it was just like, it, it's just delightful. It, it just makes it so much more fun. Yep. But I think and you I get that too with, like I was just going to say with like background actors, like you could tell when they're having fun and they're engaged. Mm -hmm. And that's when I cast shows, I typically cast like an ensemble if it's going to be an in-person show, um, which Shakespeare doesn't write ensembles, but people exist in these worlds. Like they're full of people. So why should they not be full of people? Uh, if you want to do Shakespeare, come to Shakespeare. Like I'm not going to say no, um, but it's hard sometimes with theater because, you know, everybody, nobody wants to be in an ensemble. Everybody wants to be a lead. But mm -hmm. I try to get across the idea that, like, no, this is honestly, like, going to be more fun. It's more, it's going to be more fun. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be more fun to play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Rosencrantz or Guildenstern, than it is going to be fun to play Hamlet. Will it be an acting challenge and, you know, a highlight of your acting career? Like, sure, probably, yeah, but also think about what you can do with a character that's more of a blank slate. And when you have these ensemble characters and you get to create, you are the world. You're creating the whole world on stage. Yeah. And like, you are the audience's guide. You are their, their signpost. You are like we were talking about earlier, the one who gets to depict how they, or gets to inform how they react. Like that is a position of so much power and fun. And that's one of the things that I try to get across a lot to, to actors when I'm doing casting. Cause like, I don't ever want anyone to feel undervalued in a show. Um, or, or not valued at all. Cause I felt that way. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been in, in shows where the director kind of, you can tell that they are only focused on the leads or are only focused on these couple characters or whatever. And it feels bad to be not one of those people. Yeah. And I don't ever want a cast to feel like that. So like, that's been something that when I started directing was really, really important to me. Um, but like also it's not even just because of that. It's because I legitimately think these ensemble characters are really fun. Yes. Yes. And it, so it's, we get a little bit of that. And obviously, you know, 
the ballet that I do is not American Ballet Company. You know, it is. It's community theater. But you asked me about the roles that I've had the most fun playing. And it's, I was the jester when we did Camelot. I was one of the hyenas when we did Lion King. <laughs> the amount of fun you get to have, and not just because those are both kind of comedy characters, but I I am confident in my dancing. I'm not a prima ballerina. You don't want to watch me dance, you know, the the premier ballet role because I'm not on point. And it's not it's not I with do. those <laughs> but I understand. I understand your sentence. Yes. Uh but like to have those scenes where like there was one in Camelot where literally it's so it's King Arthur and the jester and we got to have this whole silly dance where I'm like trying to hype him up and encourage him to go like meet the girl and at the very end of it I literally push him out onto stage and he crashes into her and then they have this beautiful duet like it's so fun to get to be the part of it that I got to be in that and it doesn't in any way take away from those gorgeous lead roles but it I always felt bad for some of the so usually like the high schoolers who are graduating get the lead roles and their last show. But there's always, again, depending on the show you do, there's only so many leads. And you had a lot of people who were disappointed with the character that they got. And it it broke my heart. And I don't know if it's just because I obviously have such a love for performing that I was like, I don't care. I'm just happy I'm on stage. But like, I get it. If you were hoping to be, you know, the main girl and now you're not, like that can be really hard. But it bums me out when there wasn't then a love for the character that they did get to play. Uh, so we did we did Beyond Oz, so it was kind of Wizard of Oz and Wicked combined. Cool. The girl who oh, it was super cool. It was such a fun show. Um, the girl who danced Elphaba, adult Elphaba, was by far the most technically gorgeous dancer I we've had in a long time. Like she was studying at other studios. I think she went on to dance, but. Again, she had the feet, she had the body type, like she was gorgeous. The girl who played Glinda, also an incredibly talented dancer, but I watched her because she was more fun to watch on stage. Like she got all the facial expressions, like she was not only bringing beautiful dance to the role, but she brought a personality and a character and I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And so like, okay, you didn't get to be alpha, but you didn't get to defy gravity, but you got to be really fun. Like, dancing through life you get to do all these cool things like uh so yeah so i get that <laughs> as a as an ensemble character a lot of the time and a and a member of the ballet corps i i get it <laughs> well yeah and it it's also like being an alto <laughs> for a yep. We're like yep i i'm not going to play leads in musicals because leads aren't written for altos in musicals most of the time so a lot i went through a lot of like sadness over that because in the very unhealthy theater circle i was in if you're not the lead you're ignored and so you know i had a a director once who like i worked with for a while and the uh, he like ended up spiraling down a really bad path, but I learned so much from him at the start because he made everyone feel valued. He was the type of director that when you started, like no matter who you were in a show, you got a moment and he were, it was a lot of like children's theater that we worked on. And so like, I would yeah. watch him direct and like this, this little girl, um, She's the first like child I've ever loved. <laughs> um, we did a show, an original show written, um, and it was what was it called? Uh, Little Miss Horrors. It was a take. Oh, it was a Halloween show based on a beauty pageant, like a child beauty pageant. <laughs> and it was all okay. like, the children of of monsters, you know, or like, you know, like the famous like Hollywood movie monsters. Yeah. Um, these young kids with all these like really horrible stage moms and all of that. So we had a cast of like what the teens and adults were all the stage moms and the kids were all the kids. So every adult was matched with a kid. Okay. And they gave me like the youngest child. I was like, what are you all doing? Why? Do you <laughs> uh, and she's like my favorite kid of all time, but she didn't really sing. She didn't really dance. She was six. She, you know, is, she was just kind of there because her older sister was there and she was like, all right, I guess I'll do it. Yep. But she 
and it sounds so stupid, but like there were, you know, 18 chairs on the stage to start and they were all different chairs and they were all set up in a very specific way. And she memorized the chairs. So they kind of made her an honorary stage manager and put her in charge of all of the chairs Oh at the beginning God. of the show because she knew exactly which chair this wicker chair needs to go behind this wooden chair which needs to go next to the other wicker chair which needs to like go next to the metal chair like she understood that and had it memorized and like they this director was like this is you are special because you know you have this yeah talent. and like it wasn't even on stage she like didn't do anything on stage right but like she had this power and she was uh just they put that responsibility on her not in a bad way but in like a really um powerful way and yes with all the with all of the kids there was a moment where they got to like do something and even all of the adults as well whether it's a, a facial expression reaction or a pause in the music where they laugh or like you know, it doesn't have to be a vocal solo or a dance solo. It was just a moment that every single person got. Yeah. And that's something that has stuck with me through, you know, every show that I direct and something that I try to do because everyone deserves a moment, no matter like if it's just setting, if it's setting up the chairs, because that's important. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I, again, it's, uh, I will, I will always wax poetic about the the community theater that I get to be a part of. And it's, there are auditions, mm -hmm. but if you if you show up, you sign the contract, say, I will be here and I will be at the performance and I will make rehearsals, there aren't cuts. Like, there is a place for everyone who's willing to put in the work. And at, it's one of those where those of us who've been involved in the productions for a long time, myself included, I am constant. We now do it every year. I am still constantly amazed because every person has a part, even the little, like, again, there's an age cut off just because of the nature of the show and the mm -hmm. rehearsals, but even the little eight-year-olds, they have a dance. They are a character. You are important. You are valuable in this scene because, you know, so, you know, we've had some shows where because we've had so many young kids, you'll end up with, so like, okay, so I'm trying to think of, of one that we did, but even we'll say Oz, like, so you've got, you know, some of them will be munchkins, but then you've got, you've got all of Glinda's fairies. So the Glinda fairies will have a dance, but then you'll also have like the munchkin guy come in and then like all of his people will have a dance. And like, so you go out then as like, if you're traveling through, like you're traveling through the poppy fields. So the poppies will have a mm -hmm. dance. Like, do you need it to tell the story? No, but you have the kids and you want them to have a place and you want them to be important. So there are like, anytime there's a chance to have multiple different, like, so if there would only be normally like one fairy, there's usually like a spring fairy or a summer fairy. And each of the fairies has little fairies and they yep. do a dance or yep. butterflies or like there's always something like ladybugs or lightning bugs. Like there's always an extra like one year they were when we did Phantom, they were the candles. So they came in and they had little candles on their heads and they did a dance because they were mm -hmm. the candles in his place. And yeah, I, I love it that there's always a space. If you yeah. want to be involved, there's a place for you. And that's and, what a good director should be able to do is make those spaces. And like, and yeah, that's same for, for Shakespeare. We don't do cuts. Um, and there's so much to be, there's so much room to, to make these plays even fuller than they are on paper with those additions and with people filling out the world of it. Because like I said, it exists in a world. And if you fill out that world with actual people, like it's just gonna be a more successful, I think, you know, other people might disagree. And I also love directing a three person show. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, making space for everyone and giving everyone the best experience possible is really important to me. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, obviously theater is a, a, a place with variety. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all that focus and that that's fine because there are theaters that need to make money and they can only support a cast of 10. Yes. And like, that's, that is, that's their reality and that's what they have to do. But like when you've got community spaces that are really inclusive, it, it's really nice to see. And it just gives people a love for dance or a love for Shakespeare. And that is yes. super important. Well, and I think again, I, <laughs> I hate to keep harping on it because it, 
it should be one that it was a one and done, but the guy who was being so critical of Shakespeare being accessible to everybody. And, and, and it keeps coming back to that, that at no point does the community theater production of these things diminish, we'll say the paid professional version of it. Like, you know, yeah. my community theater isn't hurting Broadway. Yeah, exactly. Also, Broadway's not hurting me. Like, it's not one it's or the other. Like, different. it's uh, not one or the other. Exactly, they can coexist safely in a in a, the same space. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, that just is to think that like my thirty person production of Romeo and Juliet is going to have any effect on the RSC release of their filmed Romeo and Juliet is <sighs> so woefully out of touch. Um, yep. But yeah, getting, I wonder about, um, because we've talked about it with dance and, and theater, but like with art and stuff, the idea of getting kids invested and involved, because like, that's always a barrier for Shakespeare, um, because so many people put the the difficulty level on it instead of focusing on the story. Like I've done, um, I did a workshop, summer workshop once with like eight, six-year-olds and they did an abridged production of Romeo and Juliet. It was like a <laughs> six page story. Uh, it was all original language. Like it, I didn't change the words at all, um, mm -hmm. but they just, they acted it out and they were so cute. They were so, I love it. so cute. And like, they owned that language because we took the time, we only had six pages. So we took the time to explain what it meant. And every kid knew exactly what they were saying and exactly what was happening in the play. And that's all you really need to know to do effective Shakespeare. Um, they got to make all their own costumes, just like draping. Oh fabric my god! Over themselves. It was the cutest thing, pretty much ever. Their parents were like so impressed. Also, <laughs> like, how did you do this? <laughs> it's, just, it's just words, and they know the words. Like if we explain it, they're gonna take ownership of it because they're creative and clever and cute. Um, yep. But how do you Ugh. bridge that gap for for art? Because like skill versus understanding versus like how do you make that accessible for them to feel proud of their their work and learn? yes and and i think it's uh this was something i had to learn i think it's partially because i was not classically trained as an instructor but the, re the reason i was an instructor is because i really like these things that i do mm -hmm. and have found a way to communicate them well and enjoy what i'm doing um, it was never a passion I had. Like the passion I have for art was a very, from my infancy to now is the thing I had. The education side of it kind of came later and fell into it. And then as I loved it more, I kept doing it. So there was something about when I first started teaching, the expectation that I had to have tactile proof of what the students learned in my class to prove why it was worthy, worthy to have them pay for this class. I think that's also part of the, I'm at an art center. I am not a part mm -hmm. of the, the regular school curriculum. I am asking parents to spend additional money to take this specialized art class. Now in my thirties, I realize that any chance you have for students to take a class with maybe only five or six students in a more specialized thing is already the benefit, <laughs> but, also, you know, I had seven week chunks. I had seven weeks of one hour a week to accomplish something with these students. It's not, that's seven hours. That's yeah, not no. actually enough. <laughs> it's not a lot of time. And so this pressure to have something to show for the end of it, I think was very detrimental to how I looked at my teaching. And so learning that it was okay. So part of what I teach them and I joke with them now is I'm going to teach you technique. I'm going to teach you things that will serve you and help you because you like this type of art. It should help you in this art in the future. I accept that it's not the way you necessarily draw now or the way you want to draw now, but it is something that is important. And my goal isn't necessarily that by the end of this class, you understand it and utilize it in your everyday art. The goal is that maybe five years from now, when you come back and be like, hey, you remember that thing you told me? I get it now. And it's actually really yeah. helpful. Like, that's it's what I want. Seeds rather than. Yeah. Like, and it. and it's the honestly, though, it's why I love teaching like middle schoolers and high schoolers, because while there are some incredibly talented kids at that age, they're still very young. Mm -hmm. You're still a young kid. So <laughs> this sounds mean. 
nobody's good. You're right. you are talented. You're not technically good, which is fine. You don't have to be. At 11, you don't have to be great at drawing the human anatomy. If you are, I'm actually a little worried. Uh, <laughs> like, what have you been studying? So, so there's that, like, trying to reinforce with them that just the fact that they're willing to create, that's the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. It's okay that you can be frustrated that your art doesn't look the way you want it to. That's okay. That's, <laughs> I hate to do it to them. I was like, it's literally something you'll struggle with the rest of your life. Good luck. Um, but it's the... I tell them, I was like, even I still struggle that it doesn't look the way I want it to. This doesn't define me as an artist just because I can't always make it look the way I want it to. So with that, then it's just, I just want to see your idea. I want to see this because you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about there is a creativity to them that is unmatched. And we talk about it as adults where you almost have to retrain yourself to be imaginative and creative with them. You literally just have to open the valve yeah, and let them at it. And I love that. And again, like I had two little boys in one of my comic book creation class, they were working on a comic already together and the hero was man, butt, and his arch nemesis, butt man, it was hilarious. I was like, it was funny. They did funny stuff. And I was like, it's stupid. Like, it's, a, it's they're silly names, but it doesn't matter because it's funny. And they were so excited about the peril that they were going to put man butt in and how they were going to get him out of that. And I was like, this is amazing. More. I want more. Work on it. Work on it. I loved it. And I was like, I'm so excited. And I saw one later. I was like, hey, are you still working on that? Like, no, we don't really anymore. But I'm working on this new thing. I'm like, that's great. You don't have to, like, one project doesn't have to be your forever project. Right, like, right. All of this. So it's That's so cute. Trying to set them up in ways where, like we keep talking about, it's the building blocks for them to be successful in the future. And mm -hmm. asking them for the hour that I see them to accept that they might be a little bit uncomfortable because I'm asking them to draw or think in a different way. But I tell them, like, once you leave the other 24 hour, or 23 hours of this day, you can draw and think however you want. I'm giving you something that I hope means something and something that hopefully helps you take it or leave it. Like it, this is how I work. You, <laughs> you compliment the art that I'm showing you in class. You say that you like that here. I'm showing you how I got to that point. You can yep. choose my path or not. That's, that that's up is. to you. Yeah. And yeah. so it's so much of it is literally <laughs> again, opening the faucet and pointing, pointing them in the direction. Like, nope, mm -hmm. just go. I'm just here to facilitate that initial valve open and then let you know when it's been an hour and I have to send you home. Yeah, um, and that's really interesting because that's where, like, it super differs from, especially from Shakespeare with the little, little, little ones um, yeah. because there's so much more uh, kind of focused explanation that they need. Um, but, like... So I, I directed Romeo and Juliet and my Romeo was 15 and my Juliet was 13 uh, <laughs> and it was beautiful and they were incredible, but they're all like younger siblings um, came to see the show. And I had these two kids who were four and five, I think at the time who were glued to the stage and had obviously zero idea what was happening, but it was like enough for them to go to their parents and say, I want to do the next one. And like, yes. so part of it is, you know, creating a visual, like you said, they see something that you've done that they like, and they want to know how to do that. And then helping them do it in their own way. Of course, the next one was um, Macbeth. And so. <laughs> but there's ghosts. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are lots of Macduff's children all die. So we had a, you know, five <laughs> and a six year old on stage dying every night. Um, they came to their audition. And they oh. said, okay, I can die standing down, standing up or sitting down. And they fell to the ground from standing up or from sitting down. And that was their audition. And I was like, I love it so much. I had so many kids in that show. I had like five under 10 year olds or like 12 and unders, I think in that show. And like, they all died, of course. Um, but it was beautiful and it was moving and it was way more emotional than it would have been if I had a, you know, 17 year old child of Macduff dying on stage. Cause when it's a four year old, like 
<laughs> sorry audience you're gonna cry today yeah uh, <laughs> but like they took that you know they had watched a show and they took it and they did their own thing with it and that was what they got out of it they knew that these were the roles open for them and they showed me how they died <laughs> Which I could just see, like, a, a little kid being so excited to be like, okay, do you want, like, a cough at the end, like, when I'm dying, dying? Or do you want me to just be quiet? Like, I love it so much. <laughs> I love it. Was it was very, very cute. Oh, it's and, so good. You know, if that gets them into one of them for her, like, school, you know, sum up your year last year, your first grade or whatever. And she wrote, like, or for kindergarten. Uh, I was in a Shakespeare play. I died in the play. And it was like her headshot from the from the play. And it was so her mom shared it with me on Facebook. Everything. Uh, that life. makes me so happy. Uh, well, and I, I realized it was something I had wanted to mention earlier when you asked. And I, again, worked my way through it and forgot. But the when you talk about taking more time for the language side of Shakespeare mm -hmm. and stuff like that, it's the... I don't see it as much and very much in this area, we have an incredible, we'll say like library system that is very on board with getting people to have comics, getting comics available to rent and to check out of the library. But you talk about the change and the stigma around comics at any point that the idea that reading a comic wasn't real reading and that part of it. So like I get these kids and I'm, honestly, I think the reason that the programs that I offer succeed in this area even though we don't have a dense population is because it is that very specific art and it is very much like you are here to talk about cartoons you are here to talk about comics i'm literally telling you this is the specific art i want to work on with you so i want you to you want to bring in the book that you're reading right now to show me yes i would love to know which comics you're reading i would love to know which what your favorite superhero is i would actually be very excited to hear you tell me about that and so, like, again, it's that not diminishing that part of the creativity. And, you know, again, we keep coming back to inclusivity, that the people who make comics are people who enjoy comics. Mm -hmm. Like, we do this because we like it. It is art, and it is writing, and it is many things, but it's still because we like this medium. Same with Shakespeare and performing. Like, we do this because we like it. And at any point, telling someone who is impressionable at any age that you're not welcome or it's not okay to to enjoy this thing a certain way like that breaks my heart and i don't i never want that for the kids i always i i gravitate towards kids because i think they are a little bit squishier and yeah. when you tell somebody you know you can't read comics because it's not real reading like that matters and that affects yeah. them i've almost gotten in fights in bookstores for <laughs> overhearing parents who steer their children away from the comic because yeah. it's not real reading yeah <laughs> no i <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh -uh. uh -uh. uh -huh. oh. All right. So let's what you let's zoom out on that. Let's see what you've got. All right. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I got into a lot more uh, heavy topics today, so I didn't work as fast. I know, right? But... Sorry. Uh, no, it harder. was good. It was, this was deep diving. This was so fun. But yeah. Oh so my god, got... I hate him so much. I love it. <laughs> like he just uh like this he face. So this face with himself. He oh he is. He is so pleased. Like oh, yeah. Hands. I just love, I love it. And just also like the little flute player guy is just my favorite. Like just, I just like him. Again. He's so cute. Ah, it's just fun. Oh my gosh. This is amazing. Um, it's, <laughs> again, my favorite play. Um, and this scene is so, and out of context too, like, Yay! I love it. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so excited about this. Ah, oh, this makes me so happy. Oh, it makes me it. happy too. Um, and yeah, thanks for diving into all that stuff today. Cause I know <laughs> it's like, it got, it got pretty heavy for a while, but like, <laughs> yeah, but it's good. And it's again, I think, uh, as we keep coming back to having a platform to talk about it and address it and mm -hmm. even relate it to other things that might make more sense to people. I, I, again, I think that's why it's important to keep having the conversations. Yeah. And I agree. Um, if you want to hear more conversations uh, from me and Swan, you can check out In Addition. It is the sister podcast of Almost Daily Discourse. And you can find us the first and third Monday of every month on twitch.tv slash almost daily pod. If you love Shakespeare, 
you can find my Shakespeare podcast, uh, where I yell about Shakespeare, uh, at P2M Pod. Spoiler alert, in two weeks, we will have a Cymbeline related episode. <gasps> Yay! Oh, yep, I found a like minded Shakespeare friend who also loves Cymbeline, and we yell about how terrible some of the people in it are. So oh, that's <laughs> exciting. That's so yeah, exciting. You can check out um, our show at anchor.fm slash P2M Pod or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of the places. Um, you can also find me at Adventure Inc. Pod, which is a DD 5e actual play. So <laughs> that's me. Yay! And Swan. That's me. You can find me across the internet at a swan named Emily, especially on the Twitch channel. That's where a lot of my art, uh, digital art, and online art is happening. Also part of the Doodle Crew. We have another episode of Doodle Crew coming up this coming week. Excuse me. So on Wednesday at 4 p.m., we will have a an episode. This one might be a small one, but we're doing redrawing our old art. So you want to see some some where I came from art? You should tune in on Wednesday and watch that. Also, again, catch me with Steph first and third Mondays. Super fun. We've had some really great guests, and all of our episodes can be found in the same feed as the boys. So if you want to hear girls and boys and everybody chatting, then it's a really fun time. Also join us at any point. You get a chance to join us in chat. We love having you or reach out yeah. to us and send us messages. Uh, if you want to see just art stuff, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. I still owe you guys posting from the last Shakespeare episode, but I <laughs> promise I will get, uh, get that up soon. Um, yeah, follow me, send me stuff. You want to chat about art or you want to chat about virtual class? I teach virtual classes. so. Yeah, come come chat with us. Heck yeah, come chat Yay. with us. We love you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good rest of your weekend, and we will <laughs> see you next month. Bye.